This is a Vault Studios production. I'm Spencer Bruding. I'm Will Johnson. I'm Jessica Knoll. This show contains graphic material and is meant for mature audiences. This was a man that was hiding in plain sight, living his normal life for four years while this case sat cold. Before we get to this week's story, story from Fox 61 in Hartford, Connecticut, we have an update on another story out of Connecticut that we told you about a few weeks ago. The disappearance of Jennifer Dulos, the mother of five who vanished one year ago in May 2019. Her husband, Fotis Dulos, charged in the murder, was found unresponsive in his car in January of this year and pronounced dead a few days later. Prior to his death, Norm Pattis represented Fotis Dulos, and just last week, the attorney spoke to Fox 61's Ben Goldman about the past year and his thoughts about the Dulos case. Starting with the, uh, the case surrounding Fotis Dulos, uh, Michelle Tracona spoke out for the first time, saying, essentially in a statement in Spanish, which I'm still a little bit confused about, she said that it was a mistake to ever have trusted Fotis Dulos, essentially. What's your take on that? Why do you think she put out this statement? You know, when Fotis died, I lost my client, and uh, an estate was opened to wind up his affairs. And the estate has made it clear that they represent what remains of Fotis' interests, Fotis's interest, and have instructed me not to speak or comment on the case at all. And I am obliged, as a matter of professional ethics, to honor them. So while I have opinions, I'm not at liberty to share them. I totally get it, and I, I want to ask you those questions, respectful of that fact. Uh, the night that, that Mr. Dulos died, just on a, on a personal manner, I remember watching you at that press conference, and you were emotionally and visibly shaken, and you kept saying, what did I miss? What did I miss? You know, in a way, you, you kind of felt like this, in a way, with his death was your fault. But right now, months later, Norm, what, what's something that keeps you up at night, banging your head? What did you miss uh, if you go back over the last 12 months? Every trial lawyer has... Um briefcases full of regrets. Um, the judgments you make are always difficult. You make the best ones you can and hope they're right. I suppose the takeaway from this year has been I can protect a client from everyone but themselves. I wish I had seen better the distress he was under. If you were to go back in a time machine, Norman, go back to May 24th, 2019, the day that Jennifer disappeared, if you had to do this entire process over again, meeting Mr. Dulos, representing him, the press conferences, the court appearances, what would you do differently? I don't know that I would do anything differently even with the outcome? Yes. Why do you say that? Again, I'm not at liberty to discuss in any detail my relationship with Mr. Dulos or the case against him, but uh, when I said the night of his death, I didn't see this coming, what did I miss? Um, I'm still not sure that this was foreseeable, given everything that I know and knew at the time. Just from an outsider's perspective looking in, is there any way in which you feel that you failed in this case? My client's dead. Yes. <laughs> but you wouldn't go back and do it any differently? Correct. You understand my confusion with that? No, I think what you're saying is if you, I think what your confusion is, if I understand it, is if you failed, how could you have succeeded? And what I told you is I think a lawyer's job is to protect clients from the world, but you can't protect a client from themselves. I don't know what led Mr. Dulos to make the decision he did, and I never will know. I totally get it, and I understand that there's probably frustration with that uh, on your end, as it is for anyone who really followed this case, the unanswered questions. And in an effort to maybe answer them or not. I understand the situation you're in right now, but I know that the gag order is lifted, but so many people around this country have looked at that final letter written by him. I know you can't say much about it, if anything at all. Um, but if you look at that day that he decided to take his own life and, and all of us were watching that entire situation play out, apparently he, he was notified of an emergency bond hearing and there were twists and turns with it, but he took one piece of paper to write down his final message. He mentioned you, his lawyer in that paper, uh, saying that you could explain what happened with, quote unquote, the trash bags on Albany Avenue. I know you probably can't say anything, but isn't there a burning desire? If there's something that you know that he says that you could explain, if you have some knowledge inside of you that could vindicate him, clear his name, give some insight, which you said that you want to fight to continue to do posthumously, isn't there a burning desire in you to share that information somehow? Yes. And, and, and what, do you, what, what can you do about it now that you don't represent that estate? Like, explain that feeling of, of knowing something that can clear someone's name that you deeply cared about, and when are you going to share it? How, how is that information, the truth, going to come out? I don't know that it ever does. I mean, the fact of the matter is that uh, my relationship was with Mr. Dulos. He's died. His, his estate winds up his affairs. The lawyers who are managing that estate have seen fit to instruct me um, to stand down. Uh, they, they've elected not to advance his interest by way of litigation. Um, whether they are pursuing the intellectual property rights in his story is not something they've discussed with me. Um, they've made it clear that, and the attorney-client privilege, and it's the privilege between his communication, but that pertains to his communications with me, extends beyond his death. So my hands are tied. Though I have an interest in telling his story. I don't have the right to tell it, and it would be unseemly for me to seek to acquire that right. The estate controls his affairs, and it's the estate's decision about whether to ever make efforts to tell a better story or not. You know, how, how frustrating was it for you to be defending somebody for the past year, looking back at this one-year anniversary, be standing in front of the courthouses, in front of the media, and, and have certain members of the media, in your words, convict 
your client, uh, based on the court of public opinion. You're known to love the media and to flip things on reporters' heads. And in a way, Norm, it's fun to watch. But, but how frustrating was it to have to prove your case inside of a courtroom and also outside in front of a press gaggle? I don't know if it was frustrating. It was a challenge that I that I loved and that I continue to love. Um, you know, um, um, I think it's easy to cast judgment, um, and we are drawn. I have a theory that we're drawn to criminal cases because we're all silent cowards. Uh, that the person who stands the loudest at the courthouse steps, screaming "You're guilty," is a person who's identifying with the accused and realizes how much they'd like to do what he did, and because they've restrained what they think he did, and because they've restrained themselves, they can't forgive the guy who actually got away with doing something that they can't permit themselves to do. So, I mean, calling out people's rage and, and desire for vengeance when they don't even know the fact is, uh, is, is, is good sport, and I enjoy it. I think it's healthy for the Republic. For more of that interview with attorney Norm Pattis, visit fox61.com. Up next, our story this week, another case out of Connecticut and a terrible crime that took place on a November night in 2014. It's been four years since that night, four years that this demon has been eating away at him, four years that investigators have poured over the murder, a case that's gone cold, and no one seems to have any answers, no one except him. And yet he's haunted by what he did. He remembers he went to a sex offenders support group and came home. He was required to go to the meeting as a registered sex offender for what he'd done a few years earlier. That was back in Colorado, convicted of a sexual assault in a case involving a minor. But he'd try to move on. And he did move on. He left Colorado and moved in with his grandparents in Simsbury, Connecticut. But then, that night, he left the meeting, went home, and he felt lonely, needing human interaction to talk to someone, anyone. He remembers going for a drive that night, parking near the post office. It's just across from the Simsbury Police Department, walking around and getting back in the car. He pulls back on the road, Iron Horse Boulevard, and then he sees her. He's never seen her before, and he doesn't know her name, but he's aroused by the sight of her. But he knows she's out of his league. He'd never have a chance with her. It makes him agitated, angry. A switch is flipped, and he's in a frenzy. He grabs a knife from the glove compartment and approaches the jogger. He confronts her. He holds the knife in his hand and plunges it into her chest. Melissa Milan was 54 years old, a mother of two and an insurance executive. She wore a headlamp on that cold November night in 2014. It must have been a familiar routine for the avid jogger and triathlete. But when that knife sunk into her chest, she'd say her last words after pushing her killer away, saying, oh my God, repeatedly before falling back over the guardrail and into the road. She was pronounced dead later that night. The man who ended Milan's life vanished from the scene. There were no witnesses. There was no knife left at the scene. News of the murder begins to spread. Police are calling this death untimely. This road where she was found sits next to the Farmington Canal Heritage Trail, a popular uh, trail for runners and bikers. Police believe Milan was out jogging when this all happened last night. I'm surprised that something like that could happen in, in this neighborhood, which is really not, not completely isolated. It's very disturbing, you know, in general. So. I just hope that justice takes place. Our hearts go out to the family. It's not something that uh, we're used to in Simsbury. But as days turned into weeks and then months, the murder remains unsolved. No new leads, nothing. It feels like a void. Like, we don't hear any updates. We don't know what's going on. One year after Milan was stabbed to death, police continue to work on the case. Simsbury Police Chief Peter Ingvrensen says his detectives have worked on the case every day. Today, he said two investigators followed up on a lead outside of Simsbury, closer to home. Milan's ex-husband, William Hodgin, is not considered a suspect. The two divorced in 2012 and share custody of their two kids. Uh, we have talked to him, um, but I uh, would not... Uh at this time claimed that he's a person of interest. The couple's 16-year-old son is a sophomore at Simsbury High School. So is Lois Black. She says the death has been tough for him. I feel yeah. bad about it because his whole life got messed up from that. Like, he'll never have a mom again. And still, a year later, residents in Simsbury don't know if the murder was random or targeted. A report by Wall Street on Parade, a financial newspaper, points to Milan as having access to highly sensitive data on bank profits from the collection of life insurance benefits. Was Milan targeted because of her role? I would say that that is something we've looked at. We were familiar with it, and we have looked into it. And continue to look into it. The only one who knows what happened to Melissa Milan that night isn't talking about it. He's trying to live a normal life. He's more or less gone back to his normal routine, working at a grocery store in a nearby town. He's even joined a church, and he's getting involved. Maybe he can move on and just forget what he's done, the life he ended. Maybe. He remembers washing his clothes that night, washing out the blood stains. He remembers wiping his boots clean. He remembers writing two confession notes, but he keeps them to himself doesn't forget what he did with the knife that night, how he threw it out the window, then went back later to pick it up. He remembers how he took it to work and put it in a trash compactor. He remembers the bloody glove he was wearing, and he remembers hiding it in a barn on his grandparents' property. 
Maybe it's there to stay, and no one will ever know what he's done. But investigators continue to look for new leads, new evidence. In 2017, three years after the murder, the Connecticut Cold Case Unit gets involved. Deputy Chief State's Attorney Lynn Boyle. We start completely afresh and look at wherever the evidence takes us. We're asking the lab to do some retesting of items, to test some items perhaps in some different ways. There will be new interviews conducted, some of people who have already been interviewed, and perhaps a few folks who have yet to be interviewed. But no new leads are shared with the public, and the killer goes on with his life. He keeps working, going to church, and living with the secret. No one seems to have any idea what he's done. No one seems suspicious. But secrets are hard to keep, especially when it eats away at you day after day, when it becomes too much to bear. Four years after plunging a knife into Melissa Milan's chest, he can't take it anymore. He has to tell someone. He reaches out to his friend, a church friend, Carrie Barrett. Fox 61 reporter Matt Karen later reported on what happened next as the case unfolded. Carrie Barrett was William Leverett's friend. Some would say it was his girlfriend. Um, and William Leverett had a conversation with Carrie Barrett where Carrie felt that William was hiding something from her. And he confessed the killing to his friend, Carrie Barrett. And Carrie said, you need to confess to God. She leads him to the pastors at his church, Michael and Colette Trzinski at Open Gate Ministries. They've known him for almost four years, almost since the time of the murder. The entire time he's been carrying the secret and this guilt. Can't come to a really understanding as to why he did this. It was just a, a time before we met him. He's been a faithful member of the church, very helpful. Um, we never would have expected this. And with this secret out, the horrible truth of what he's done out in the open, he heads to the Simsbury Police Department. As he was leaving, he, he made a statement as they were ready to go to the police station that this demon won't be able to bother him any longer. On September 19th, 2018, 27-year-old William Leverett walks into the Simsbury Police Department. So on the night that he confessed, he walked into the Simsbury Police Department and he told the police that he had murdered Melissa Milan. And he proceeded to explain how he had done it, what he did with the weapon, and tried to explain why he did it. For four and a half hours, Leverett talks to police, sharing details about his movements that night, driving around and spotting the jogger, taking the knife from his glove compartment, and then killing Melissa Milan, a random, senseless, and unplanned murder. Brian Foley is a former Hartford police officer turned Fox 61 chief investigator. Now he's working with the Connecticut State Police. For a guy to walk in with a gift wrap confession like it's Christmas morning for the detectives, uh, that is a big win uh, for anybody. It's just, uh, that's the kind of stuff you hope and pray for uh, as a detective, especially in a, in a case like this. This is just a random killing. Investigators are hopeful they've got their guy, but he's not handcuffed yet. They have to be sure he really did what he's saying he did. So you got a killer. He just walks in the front door of a police station and says, yes, I killed this woman, this innocent woman. I attacked her and killed her. And this is this is the, the absolute perfect description of a monster in everyone's eyes. And all of a sudden, the Sinsbury police take his confession and then cut him loose on the street. That obviously is going to concern the community. But a couple things. First, let me explain how that process works. The, the guy walks in and he confesses to all this stuff. The police just can't, because people have confessed to stuff that they didn't do, uh, because they want to make sure they have probable cause and don't arrest him improperly, they bring those facts that he that the killer tells them to the state's attorney. And the state's attorney's office here in Hartford is the one that covers the, the town of Simsbury. They determine if there's enough to arrest that person on the spot. So that's what they do. They wait for more evidence. The probable cause they need to be sure this is really the killer. Good detectives, and I talked to some of the detectives on that case, they put a tail on them. You know, just cut them loose. And I've sat on, uh, in my career, I've sat on people that have, you know, serial killers. And you wait for that arrest warrant to come through in that period between where you let them walk out the door or you know he did it, and between that time and when the arrest warrant comes, you have a tail on them. And you watch that person and you make sure they don't do anything. And that's what happened in the Sinsbury case. So it wasn't like they just cut him out the door and said, thank you very much. And we'll see you in a couple of days. He had surveillance on him, a tail on him the entire time. You know, like that guy, uh, if he drank a soda, the cops knew what flavor it was. The next day, he leads police to that evidence, that smoking gun that would give them probable cause. William Leverett led police to a barn where he threw a bloody glove after killing 54-year-old Melissa Milan in 2014. That barn was on his grandparents' property where he lived, 21 Goodrich Drive in Simsbury. The glove landed in a cavity between two walls and sat there for years before being recovered. The DNA analyzed, Leverett arrested. I am hopeful that this arrest and the following court proceedings will help this community with the healing process. As for the motive for the killing in this case, Leverett told police that he didn't want to tell one of his friends, Carrie Barrett, about his sex offender status, so he thought that killing someone would, quote, make it all go away. And one month later, he appears in court. William Leverett appeared before a judge today and pleaded not guilty to the murder of Melissa Milan. Just last month, he walked into a police department and confessed to the murder. Leverett also spoke out in court and waived his right to a preliminary hearing.
Given what I know about my own case and what I've discussed with my lawyer, I believe that maybe it is a reasonable thing to do. Open Gate Ministry pastors Colette and Michael Trzinski were overcome with emotion following a court appearance by 27-year-old William Leverett. And he wants to apologize to the family. He, yeah. he was broken. He was really broken if you saw him. She had a life and someone took that away. 31 years hunting for her mom's killer. And it's going to end with me getting the person that killed my mom. Pune Gray is closer than ever. So these are dangerous people. Extremely dangerous people. From the team that brought you Urge to Kill, I'm Ashley Korsland. Are you willing to go to war, so to speak? And this is The Yellow Car. I'm always ready for anything. Subscribe now. I'm Will Johnson. I'm here with Jessica Knoll. Spencer Brudig is out this week. And we're joined by Fox 61's Matt Caron. He is a reporter anchor at Fox 61 in Hartford. Thanks for being here. Jessica and uh, Will, thanks so much for having me. So I, I want to jump right into this. What is the current status of the case and where is Leverett at this point? Uh, Leverett is sitting in a jail cell. And there's really been no movement on the case since 2018 when he was taken into custody. Um, right now he's awaiting trial. He elected to have a jury trial. I mean, what's interesting about this is you have a man who walked in to a police department and confessed to a murder, said that he did it, pretty much laid out how he did it, and then he pleads not guilty. Um, a lot of that is just, a, you know, the judicial process playing out. Once you get a public defender, uh, of course, he's going to advise you to always plead not guilty. And even though the police have a confession, he pled not guilty. He's in jail. He's uh, currently awaiting a jury trial. I'm no legal expert, but I highly doubt if this case ends up going to trial. I think uh, that he'll plead out. Matt, let's talk a little bit about Simsbury, the general suburbs, the jogging trail, where this happened. I mean, we mentioned briefly in our story that it's a, you know, a nice quaint town in Connecticut, right? It really is. Uh, you know, Simsbury is a rather affluent community here in uh, Connecticut. Um, it's a quiet suburb. And this was at like a regular night, November 20th, 2014, kind of getting cold. Um, it was in the evening hours, and she was just jogging along this trail like she did many nights. She never thought she'd have this kind of an encounter. She, from what we know, um, and, and we talk about it in this episode, she's an avid runner, and she was a mom. But what else can you tell us about Melissa and her family? Uh, Melissa's got two kids, as you mentioned. She is a well-respected, well-known member of the Simsbury community. She's 54 years old at the time when this happens, and she is an insurance executive uh, from Mass Mutual a well-known insurance company, and of course, Connecticut being uh, the insurance capital of the country uh, in many respects. So you have this, uh, you know, very well-known family and this very well-known mother, you know, loving, caring, and uh, this horrible tragedy ends up befalling her. Matt, uh, one of the interesting parts about this story, and we do cover it in the podcast, but let's touch on it briefly, just this idea that when someone walks in and confesses, and in this case especially, they don't arrest him on the spot. In fact, there wasn't just that one first interview. There was another one the next day, right, before he then leads him to evidence. Yes, absolutely. You know, there is video of William Winters Leverett as he is walking in to the lobby of the Simsbury Police Department, and he's carrying with him what looks to be a bunch of books. And of course, he's got his cell phone with him. And he's in the lobby for about seven minutes. He goes up to the dispatch window. He introduces himself. He says, I'm here to discuss uh, the murder of Melissa Milan. And of course it piques the dispatcher's interest. Uh, so she says, take a seat on the bench, sir. And he does. Seven minutes later, a police officer finally comes out into the lobby and greets them. And then you see him being led away into an interrogation room. It's a very powerful video. And when you see him enter the lobby, he walks in with, uh, with Colette and Michael Trzinski, who are his pastors from an at-home church that he attended. And they were very instrumental, the Trzinskis, in turning his conscience and ultimately helping him realize that what he really needed to do was confess. And that's exactly what he did. He did confess, but he was not arrested that night. What was the community's reaction to that? I mean, a lot of people think you have a killer, you know, who walks in and, and hands it to you on a silver platter. I killed her. I did it. This is where I hid the weapon. This is what she was wearing. Details that only a killer would know. And you would say, well, why wasn't he put into handcuffs? But you have to look at it from this perspective, too. If you're an investigator, if you're a detective, this is a man that very likely has mental illness. And you can't just take someone's word for it. So an investigator, a detective, has to do their due diligence. And they said, OK, sir, thank you very much. And they approached the state's attorney's office with this evidence, which is what you do in this situation. And 
ultimately that's who makes the decision because they're the ones who have to bring charges. They're the ones who have to prosecute. So if the state's attorney feels like they need more, then they will not arrest that person on the spot. In fact, very rarely do they do. So from a community standpoint, certainly it, it is on its face alarming that you have a confessed killer who is then let go, released back into the community. But it was not done in a haphazard way. They needed more. And then so they, they, they and then that's what ended up happening. William Leverett gave them more. He brought them to the weapon. He told them exactly how he did it and why he did it. This was a man that was hiding in plain sight, living his normal life for four years while this case sat cold while being a half a mile from the police department. Yeah, that strikes me as, as something that just really sticks out about this case and the tragedy. And really, when all said and done, you've got a, a mother of two kids who is no longer on the earth. And th the reason for it is inexplicable and, and really just horrifying for people who, who live there and, and for her family. Yes, for sure. Matt Karen, thanks so much for talking to us about this case. And we appreciate all of your uh, excellent reporting. Matt Karen from Fox 61 in Hartford. Thank you guys so much. Good to be with you. All right, Jessica, where can people learn more about us? Yeah, well, we are on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and we have a Facebook group called Inside the Crime Vault where you can join us and about 4,000 other people who are discussing this case and other cases that we are looking into. And we'll be back next week with a new case and a new story.